Come gather around, folks, and I'll tell you a tale. They were kind of legendary, I suppose. About some good workers who were put up for sale. No, it was like they'd always been there. Not way back in history on a southern plantation. So getting stuff printed from them was one thing, but the act of going to the shop to get stuff was different as well, like it was a, an event in and of itself. I think there's other companies that would not have necessarily wanted to deal with little people or anarchists or other kinds of odd people who had weird posters they were putting out, you know. Kay and Tony would print kind of anything they thought, you know, it was ethically okay to print. I still firmly believe that you had to be there at Data Stream to know what was happening. Lots of my ordinary customers had no idea about the political aspect. I was very careful, uh, and still are, about what work I did when I was open. Mainly because I didn't want to ever have to discuss it with them. You know? I didn't want to know if they didn't agree, and I didn't care what they thought. Printing always seemed to be a way of allowing people to have a say. First shop, Victoria Street, offset printing, metal plates, inks, small offset stuff. Photocopying, colour copying, which was a major advance. Someone who worked for me for years and years and years. This is the 80s. I first met Tony in 1971. So all the photos pretty much are taken by him, me, or our daughter. And it stops at 2008 when we went digital with the camera and I stopped taking photos because I decided I'd had enough. So that's what it's all about. But seeing as you're interested in data stream, I thought, well, there you go. Spent so much time there, like I remember these um, amazing little spots that I would find that would be like little cubby holes. I just loved cubby holes when I was a kid. So I would crawl under like, you know, um, shelves of paper and just sit down there and draw or cut up paper or build forts. I find it so interesting these days to um, hear how other people have been brought up and how they don't know their neighbours or they don't walk down the street and know the shop owners because that was just who we were. People would come and cry and... Um, laugh and there'd be fights and serious discussions. I'm not quite sure, it might have been by the early 90s that they'd, somewhere then, um, that they moved to Garrett Street, which... What was a bit later than that? I know because yes, I, was what was the date? I was photocopying things for Emma as late as 1990, in, uh, as late as 2000 in Victoria Street. It was really getting I into might the, have, between yes, 2000 might have, and 2010. That she and was I think my memory is playing Ducks and Drakes with me because I'm now nearly 86. <laughs> she, there might have been a place in between Victoria Street and, uh, and Garrett Street. People think that I started Data Stream, but I didn't because I didn't make up the name or anything like that. Though I think it's a very good name. It's Kay and a friend of ours were sitting around talking in our living room one evening and Kay had been working at government print and got trained as an offset operator and this guy said oh look I know of this guy and he's got a little printing place and he wants to sell it why don't you buy it Kay? You couldn't at that point have an apprenticeship as a female in the printing trade unless it was the bindery. You definitely couldn't have an apprenticeship to learn to run a machine. I thought, well, why couldn't I? Really, you know, I'm sure I could. The very first day that we opened DataStream, 
two men from the printing trade who ran printing businesses in Wellington came to visit. Tony was in Australia, so we didn't even have a male presence. And it was me and one employee. And they came and sat down and they said, ho, 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 ladies. Give us your price list. And I said, oh no, we don't have a price list. They were basically bullies and they wanted to intimidate me. They thought it was a great lark, a woman like me having a printing place. And they were always like that. These machines, they can spit out hundreds of copies of pamphlets or whatever you want to. There's some kind of power in that, the idea of self-publishing and the idea that this place enables that. I guess printing as a medium has always been the way to get information out. And if that information's always been disseminated by men, then it's great that there's women doing it as well. Some printing from the 1980s, thousands of them. It was a big thing, trying to make the streets safe for women to get around without men. Hundreds produced of these things. And posters, offset printing, pink ink, purple ink, not full colour, okay? Done on small machines, leaflets, stickers. Hilariously, a Māori English Dictionary for Children. Now you would have thought in 1986 there was already something. No, nope, not even a proper book. People just started producing and making things in order for it all to happen. Data stream printed them. The HIV situation occurred in the 80s, so necessary once again to have good information, comics in a way that people who were going to be at risk would be able to have access to. That is that, Kathleen. She always reviewed my staff. <laughs> I could send them along, it was quite a good sort of um, test of their character, whether they could sort of survive the interview process with Kate. And they were mostly women, and, um, and she's very interested in the development of, of young women. She did the same thing to me, you know. She made sure I knew what I was about. <laughs> I don't know, I just felt very connected to her and like there was something similar in a way about us. Or it's like, you know, when you kind of, you, you just like kind of get somebody. She showed me a drawing and um, I think it was of a tree and it was really beautiful. And then the weaving on the wall that she'd done. One that I did, I think it was called I'd Rather Be Masturbating and it was like tiny little drawings that I'd done in my books throughout that year and I just got it photocopied. I think she told me that she like wouldn't be printing them when other people were around, but also that she was glad that I was doing it. In 2006, I started working with a group of women, uh, local anarcho-feminists, to produce these real calendar girls' calendars. We ended up doing them every year for six years, and we always got them printed at Datastream. This calendar was quite interesting. This was about um, inspirational lyrics by female musicians. Ah, and there's me. That was the band I used to be in. <laughs> That's the Feminazis. <laughs> Yeah, I think some people thought it was a bit full on being called the Feminazis, but it was kind of a reclamation of the word, you know, like cunt and other words that are oppressive of women. You know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes 
uh, blood coming out of her wherever. I started doing gig posters like kind of for the punk scene in Wellington and that um, was a big, has been a big part of my like art process for many years and that scene is really lively and it's kind of got all these different DIY facets that mean that people can kind of do heaps, you know, you've got screen printing and zine making and just all these different elements. But I didn't want to make art that didn't mean anything to, to people who hadn't been to art school. Yeah, I wanted to make it like really obvious <laughs> what I was saying and, and I felt like I had things to say. They assisted activists for so long and they were so much a part of the community that like they are, they're so much more than just, you know, even just the printing. Well, I, I did a zine um, called Help My Snowman's Burning. Uh, it was all very um, sort of end of the century stuff. <laughs> end of the century stuff, meaning late 90s. Uh, the world's got to end. It's all falling apart. Let's just, you know, get on with it. You know, it, it feels like it's been like that, you know, even now. <laughs> Everyone's going, oh, it's the apocalypse, but it's like, nah, we've been dealing with this stuff for a while. I ran a zine distro called the Red Letter Zine Distro in the early 2000s, and it was pre-internet and it was a paper catalogue, but what this was, um, a lot of um, publications that came through that I was interested in internationally that I would order off the back pages of other larger fanzines. The all-important order form and postage conversion. So I had a good relationship with Datastream and I had a good relationship with the post office in Kilburnie. It seemed quite simple. Like, we just like created these structures for ourselves and trusted they worked and they did. And we were very young and idealistic and it worked for a really good time, which, yeah. This is a good thing, yeah. Dad is um, a man who loves to um, love with gifts. When I was flatting, he used to just show up at my work with bags of oranges and apples. That was his way of showing love. Tony, he, back in the day, could take up a lot of your time. It was quite nerve-wracking <laughs> if you went in there and Kay was out doing the banking or deliveries, generally having a break from her shop and probably from Tony. And um, he would get very in-depth and complicated and record all of the details. But more than once, he saved us from a chronic spelling mistake. Oh yeah, yeah, I'd get a lecture, I'd go to visit and uh have a coffee and Tony would be um, giving me a small lecture on something and he'd send unsolicited envelopes in the mail. You get these big envelopes and he'd have photocopy these articles out of some obscure bluegrass journal or some book he'd found in the back of the library and you'd think Bernard needs a copy of that and that would be all nicely bound with a cover. It was almost, it was almost sort of like you know informal informal lecture session, sessions with Tony and, <laughs> and ethnomusicology of the of blues and folk music or something or other. So so that, you know, and all the time pff, there's photocopying stuff and guillotining stuff. It's like almost secondary to the whole kind of thing. And Kay would just be in the background and sort of coo in and then, you know, um, and then you'd leave enriched somehow. I'll tell you about this because Tony will know all about this instrument. This is a Cuban, what they call a Cuban threes. You know, but it's sort of played as a, as a sort of riffing instrument, so you can sort of... Got a tune, actually. <laughs> so that's what I'm playing. They were interested in, 
in the poster when you were playing and quite often they say, oh, you play so-so, oh, must come along, you know. He doesn't want me to say this either, but he's helped lots of other young musicians who were probably surprised to get a weird tape of old time fiddle or banjo, frailing banjo music. <laughs> Here we do, this is an old time American song. It's called What Will I Do With A Baby O? And uh, Tony will like this one. Back in the day, people would sort of say, look, we've got this rally. We've got this rally next week. We want a song for it. So, you know, I'd put something together and it would help to brighten the thing up. So I, I would write, compose something that would sort of express how people felt. I'd like to make CDs, you know, different sort of music. And so I, I asked one of one or two musical acquaintances. I said, oh, where, where do you get your cover, CD cover stuff? And they mentioned one or two people. I talked to some of these people. And, and the sort of prices they were quoting was just ridiculous, you know. I just want a bit of lettering on my photo on the, on the front. <laughs> yeah, and look, not looking too, too crap, you know. So anyway, I sort of I mentioned to, um, um, to Tony, and so he did that one, uh, that one, that one, and that one. And um, he just did this for fun, for the cost of printing it. So uh, yeah, I sometimes I just I, I've come in just to look at all these things. Earwig, these are early print publications from the 1970s. This is how things got printed back in the day, and it was all offset. And actually, I mourn with Kay the loss of offset because everything now is digitally printed, and even your early digital machines don't do the same sort of amazing kind of clarity of. Uh, printing as, as the current lot. It's like everything's become mediocre in the face of digital technology. This is, this, this is a early printing that Kay did for me of this comic. And it, the colours are really nice and bright and it's really hard to get them now on the new machines. But nothing compares to this. And that's, um, you know, that's 40 years old. I've always tried to keep it on the low, you know. Sometimes I don't even put my name on my comics, um, funnily enough. I, 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 I have an alter ego. Do I? Yeah, remember when we were doing white fungus? Yes, that's right. I called myself Tanya Bat for a while. Like I say, I don't usually put my name on things that I think are too controversial. Not because I, but partly because I, they represent something else. Like I, I do them as deliberate political pieces of propaganda, if you like, for, for Peace Action Wellington. The Navy has decided for the very first time in 30 years since the anti-nuclear legislation to invite an American warship. It just happens to coincide when the weapons expo is on. So this is quite a historic kind of a moment really and there will be large protests. There probably won't be a huge flotilla like there was in the anti-nuclear protests mainly because the government have banned boats from the Waitemata Harbour and the Auckland Harbour. Um, the, wait a minute, stop Kathleen, I'm getting lost. Well, I know that she's got a head that thinks that way, thinking about the political system, social system, the, just the structure, the nature of society. And yeah, I'm into political, socio-political struggle. Yeah, no apology about that made that clear with our first song, Air 2. I can remember back then, in 88, our manager at the time saying, we had this song called That's The Beat, which I wrote as well. And he's like, you know, we, we could release this. You know, it's like a pop song, you know, they'd like it in the, in the charts, you know, we could get some, maybe some chart action with this. And I'm like, hell no. The first song I thought possibly bring out and I'm known for is Air 2, Stand Proud. Get kaha, say it loud, that's it. Air 2, Stand Proud. Kia ka, say it loud. Air two, stand proud. Kia ka, say it loud. Yes, 
I put on the Aotearoa International Festival of Arts and Resistance because this country should have a protest event. It doesn't have protest events. I do another protest event on February the 6th because the only protest event really that happens then for Māori people is at Waitangi itself. But I want to have another thing just in the air, Tinoranga Tira Tanga, protest music and struggle. And everyone else I knew that was getting posters, I'd bump into people around, you know, going in there or just around. Yeah, everyone get their posters done at the artist stream. So it, it was definitely some kind of hub in a way for people in Wellington City. As the customers got older, sometimes they did just come in because their pacemaker wasn't working right and they would sit down and have to have a few breaths and a glass of water, you know, or they'd lose their car. number of times I had to go out there and try and find somebody's car, you know, because I couldn't remember what they'd done with it. Shall I? I'm going well. I did like a great deal of them. And some of them were coming and knew to come at half past four, half an hour before I closed, when the room wasn't filled with lots of other people. And they knew they would get me to talk then. Mum looks after Willow a couple of days a week at the moment while I'm at work. and. She said they just sit around laughing. She said she loves it. It's just um, because she's retired, it's this perfect time of getting to look after um, her granddaughter. And they just said it's like pure joy, just hanging out. How do people who just work away at shit, not seeking acknowledgement or anything like that, how does the community come back and say, thanks, that was fucking cool and couldn't have done it without you in the way that we did? Like I was saying before about these little protest songs, I mean, they sort of, they were about issues and a lot of the issues that, um, which seemed very important at the time and were important at the time, but sort of, they get, they get sort of buried, you know, they sort of, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of sort of grassroots history gets, gets lost because no one thinks to put it down. I think that um, paper and print will live on forever and uh, long after digital technology has disappeared and um, I think there will always be comic books <laughs> and um, I think there will always be a need for printing, mm, that's what I think. So thank you Kay and oh it's been awful. How dare she retire? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why I haven't really ma been making zines. Maybe it's because they're gone. Maybe I can't make zines anymore. I wanted to tell them that I loved them. And what they did was, for me and for lots of other people, was amazing. <laughs> yeah, and I miss Data Stream all the time. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, Kathleen, it's a huge fight just to try and keep everyone alive and breathing and data stream was just some part of it do you know where it could be helpful you know and you know if you look after your little area and the next person looks after their little area well then it should be there should be a world for willow to have i was working on a place down lampton quay and i can't say the job meant much to me the hours were long and the pay was low and the days and the hours and the minutes and the seconds went by real slow. Sometimes the worker would complain a bit but the boss never gave a tom tit. He'd have a quiet word with a bloke concerned then back on the job with a lesson learned or else out the door, down the road. <laughs> <laughs>